It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, Section 11.8 of the Liberal Party's uh, Constitution says you, the Leader, must communicate your decision. Order, please. Um, no interjections. I need to hear the question because I'm listening carefully. <laughs> the Constitution says that you, as leader, uh, have to uh, communicate your decision as soon as possible uh, if you've made the decision to appoint a candidate. Uh, you claim you made your decision in November, and you claim you told Mr. Olivier of your decision in December. Yet you didn't tell the Riding Association until January 7. Premier, why did you breach your own constitution and wait for over a month to tell the Riding Association of your decision? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, again, let me be let me be very clear. And I've made uh, I've made this statement uh, about my decision um, many many times. It was well known, Mr. Speaker, uh, that uh, Glenn Tebow was going to be our candidate in Sudbury. And Mr. Speaker, uh, we're very pleased about that. We're very pleased to have him. And I formally wrote to the Riding Association President and Nominations Commissioner on the day of the by-election. That's when the I also want to hear the answers. And I don't want any more interjections from the member from Timmins James Bay. That's when the paperwork was completed, but it was well known that Glenn Tebow was going to be our candidate. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. During question period, you've repeatedly said. I had made that decision at the end of the November, once I had met with Glenn Thibault, that decision was made. Yet uh, Andrew Olivier told the OPP the conversation he had with you on December 11th was the same one, uh, as the one he had had earlier that day with Jerry Lougheed Jr. In that conversation, he was being offered a job or a bribe to step aside as the candidate and to nominate Glenn Thibault instead. Premier, if you made the decision in November, why didn't you tell Andrew Olivier on December 11th that there would be no nomination? Mr. Speaker, let me, let me say once again that once I had had a meeting with uh, Glenn Tebow because I, had, uh, I hadn't met him, after all, he'd been part of another party, Mr. Speaker. He was making a decision about, uh, about his future. Once I had met him, Mr. Order. Speaker, at the end of November, I made a decision that he would be the best candidate for us in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, and uh, that, that was the decision that I had made, Mr. Speaker. The paperwork, the paperwork was completed uh, in uh, in January, Mr. Speaker, but it was well known long before that that uh, Glenn would be the candidate for us in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Back to the Premier. The taped conversations between Pat Sobera and Jerry Lougheed Jr. with Andrew Olivier stand in stark contrast to your statement, Premier, that Andrew Olivier was told before December 11th that he would not be the Liberal candidate. Premier, you have repeatedly asked. You've been repeatedly asked for evidence to back up your version of events. Your letter of January 7th tears even more holes into your implausible story. Yeah. You need to end this farce. Stop denigrating the office that you hold. Tell Ontarians once and for all, did you authorize Pat Sabera or Jerry Lougheed Jr. to have those conversations with Mr. Olivier? She got Mr. Mr. Speaker. Once again, I take this matter very seriously, and the member opposite knows that there's an investigation going on and that that investigation is happening outside of this House, Mr. Speaker. It's an independent process. And I have to say that I actually agree with the, uh, the PC House leader, who on February 27th said this, Mr. Speaker. Um, he said that, and I quote, Stop interfering in an ongoing investigation and let it run its course, Mr. Speaker. Unquote. The fact is that there is an investigation going on. Uh, I am going to let that investigation run its course, Mr. Speaker, but it's going to run its course outside of this legislature, independently of the House, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Premier Associate uh, Chief Justice Douglas Cunningham of Ontario Superior Co Co Court excuse me, wrote, Appointments to government offices are not to be traded for political favour. Mm -hmm. They are appointments that must be made in a fair, Deputy open, House Leader. transparent manner. Premier, you tried to sneak an appointment or Which job is offer East York. to Andrew Olivier past the people of Ontario. It was not fair, it was not open, it was not transparent. Premier, again, did you direct Jerry Lougheed Jr. 
and or Pat Sabera to offer Mr. Olivier an appointment to step aside. Good we, uh, let me just again say I challenge the premise of the question and uh, the statements that the, uh, the uh, interim leader of the opposition has made. Um, and I would remind him, Mr. Speaker, that there is an investigation going on. I would also remind him of what the chief electoral officer said, Mr. Speaker, um, that he, uh, he said that the, uh, he determined that the allegations against me and the member for Sudbury were baseless, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. He went on to say, and I quote, I am neither deciding to prosecute a matter nor determining anyone's guilt or innocence. Those decisions are respectively for prosecutors and judges." Unquote. He did not say that those are decisions for the interim leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker. Those are decisions for the people who are involved in the investigation, and we're going to let that unfold as it must. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Justice Cunningham uh, has also said that the criminal code bribery provisions are aimed at preventing influence peddling in order to protect the public's confidence in the integrity and appearance, uh, and appearance of integrity of the government. Premier, according to a recent poll, the public's confidence in your integrity is pretty low. Two-thirds of Ontarians want your Deputy Chief of Staff to resign. Premier, will you restore some semblance of integrity to your office and step aside? If charges are laid against either Pat Sabera or Jerry Lawhey Jr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I made a statement uh, two Fridays ago. Mr. Speaker, I said that uh, I said that um, you know there there were uh, there were clear actions that needed to be taken if there were were a charge laid oh, against uh, anyone, and that Pat Sabera would step aside if that were the case. Mr. Speaker, that's in the public realm. I made it very clear. But I also said, Mr. Speaker, that there is an investigation going on. We need to let that we need to let that investigation unfold, and that investigation will unfold outside of this House, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Premier. Your very own Jerry Lawhey Jr. once said, a solution by fat cats in Toronto may not be the right solution for Sudbury. But you made the decision, Premier, to appoint a candidate from behind your desk here at Queen's Park, and you, prepare, and you were prepared to offer Mr. Olivier a government appointment or job so he wouldn't stand in the way of your decision. Premier, you have sullied the integrity and the dignity of the office you hold. Salvage what little public confidence is left in you. Commit to the people of Ontario that you will resign as Premier if either Jerry Lougheed or Pat Sabera are convicted of an offence of bribery. Thank you. You seated, please. You seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I've said clearly that uh, I will cooperate with the authorities, that that investigation is taking place outside this House, and we need to let it unfold there, Mr. Speaker, and I will, I will continue to, uh, to work closely with the authorities, as, uh, as is the right thing to do, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On what date did the Premier provide the Liberal Party's nomination commissioner and Sudbury Riding Association president the written notice that she was appointing Glenn Thibault as the Liberal candidate in Sudbury? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As the, uh, as the member opposite, I think, knows full well, um, I have uh, made many statements about my decision to, uh, to have uh, Glenn Thibault as the candidate in Sudbury. I made that decision, Mr. Speaker, after I met him at the end of, no of November. I think the member opposite also knows that I formally wrote to the Riding Association President and Nominations Commissioner on the day that the by-election was called. Mr. Speaker, that's when the paperwork was completed. The decision was made much before that, and it was well known that Glenn was going to be our candidate. Thank you. Well, Speaker, January 7th, that's the date, almost a month after Pat Cerbera and Jerry Lougheed were taped offering Andrew Olivier anything he wanted to step aside. Almost a month after those phone calls were made on behalf of the Premier, almost a month after the Premier's own conversation with Mr. Olivier, there is now written evidence, in addition to taped evidence, that the Premier's story does not add up, Speaker. Now, I ask the Premier, will she have one more conversation with her soul, Speaker, this time about the need to come clean with the people of Ontario? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you know, <laughs> when I say it was well known that uh, Glenn Thibault was going to be our candidate, it really wasn't that long ago. There were newspaper reports. It was quite, uh, it was quite in the public realm that Glenn Thibault was going to be our candidate, Mr. Speaker. So I would just say to the member opposite that she can, check, she can check the record and she can— uh, and it's true. The paperwork was completed on 
on the day that uh, the election was called, Mr. Speaker, but the, it was common knowledge long before that that Glen Tebow was going to be our candidate. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier insisted that she decided to appoint Glen Tebow long before the Liberal operatives were dangling jobs in front of Andrew Olivier. But the Premier's letter to the Liberal Party makes it clear that she only appointed Glen Tebow after those attempts had failed. This is a question that the Premier has been asked 44 times, but she has not given a straightforward answer yet. Who gave Pat Sorbera and Jerry Lougheed their orders to get Mr. Olivier out of the way so that Glenn Tebow could have an uncontested nomination? Thank you, Senior. Mr. Speaker, again, I will say that the investigation that's going on is going on outside of this legislature, and it's very important that it be independent and that we let that, uh, that, we let that unfold. And in fact, the NDP member for Timmins James Bay said last week, and I quote, you do have a larger responsibility to make sure you're careful in your use of words so that you don't interfere in any way, unquote. That's the member for Timmins James Bay. Mr. Speaker, I think if the, mem if the leader of the third party would just turn to her right and talk to the member for Timmins James Bay, she would understand that it's important that all of us, all of us, let the investigation take place outside. I made a decision at the end of November. I made a decision at the end of November that Glenn Tebow would be the best candidate for us in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker. I think that was the right decision. Uh, to confirm to make sure he heard me, the member from Renfrew and Nipissing Pembroke come to order. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. <clears throat> there is evidence that Andrew Olivier was offered any job he wanted in order to get out of the Premier's way. There is evidence that Pat Sorbera and Jerry Lougheed were acting on orders from the Premier. And there is evidence in black and white Minister that the Premier made the decision to appoint to order. her candidate after attempts to get Andrew Olivier out of the way failed. Of course, the pre Premier still claims that all this evidence is wrong. Does the Premier have any evidence to support her version of the story, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, I challenge much of uh, the premise of the, uh, the leader of the third party's question, Mr. Speaker. I made a decision at the end of November, having met uh, our candidate, having met uh, Glenn Tebow, that he would be the best candidate for uh, the Liberals in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker. The people of Sudbury made a decision. The people of Sudbury voted for Glenn Tebow, and we have a new member on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, because he was the best candidate for Sudbury. The people in Sudbury made that decision, Mr. Speaker. I know that's painful for the third party. I understand the, the degree to which that's painful, Mr. Speaker, but the fact is the people of Sudbury made a decision. There's an investigation going on, and that investigation is going on outside of this House, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, any Ontarian with a computer or a smartphone can hear the tapes of Pat Sorbera and Jerry Lougheed offering jobs to Andrew Olivier on behalf of this Premier. The OPP warrant is available publicly, Speaker. Elections Ontario reported its finding that there is evidence that there is evidence that senior Liberals broke the Elections Act, and that report is publicly available, Speaker. And now Ontarians can read about a letter showing that the Premier didn't appoint her candidate until after she found out that she could not get Andrew Olivier out of the way. But in that growing mountain of evidence, there isn't a single shred that backs up the Premier's version of events, Speaker. Question. Is there anything at all, anything, Speaker, that the Premier can show us that backs up her version of this Thank bribery you. scandal from Sudbury? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, as I said, it was well known long before the paperwork was completed that uh, Glenn Tebow was going to be our candidate, Mr. Speaker. That's a matter of, uh, of public record. And as I have said, the investigation that's ongoing is happening outside of this House. We need to let it, uh, we need to let it unfold in an independent way outside of the legislature, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final the Premier seems to be more comfortable answering police questions than answering questions here in the Legislature. It's getting quite ridiculous, it Speaker. People actually deserve so much better than this. They deserve to know that—
I uh, did not get quiet for you to interject, a member from Timmins, James Bay. Please finish your question. They deserve to know that their politicians play by the rules, Speaker. And they deserve to know that the Premier of Ontario is going to, to answer to questions and tell the truth without first receiving a subpoena or a warrant or being interrogated by the OPP. What evidence does the Premier have to back up her story, Speaker? Premier. Mr. Speaker. I agree with the leader of the third party that the people of Ontario deserve to know that their politicians are going to answer questions, Mr. Speaker, and I will do that. I will answer questions here, and Mr. Speaker, I will work with the authorities. I have said over and over again, Mr. Speaker, first that I made a public statement. I made it clear, Mr. Speaker, when I had made the decision and what that decision was, that Glenn Tebow would be our candidate, Mr. Speaker. I've also said that I will work with the authorities absolutely in every way that they ask of me that they require mr speaker yeah. but i will do that outside of that outside of this house yeah. because that's where the investigation is taking place that's where the authorities are not here they are outside of the house mr speaker thank you speaker speaker my question is to the premier premier are you familiar with this following quote i can't fire them simply on the basis of charges they have to have their day Deputy in court. House Leader. They have to have a chance to prove their innocence. I have got to see more than this. Premier, does this quote sound familiar? Do you know what this quote is in reference to? Premier. <laughs> Are we playing Jeopardy? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, I, you know what? I am sure. I am sure that the member opposite is going to tell me chapter and verse exactly where that quote comes from. In the meantime, I will say to him that I've been quite clear that I will cooperate with the authorities. I've been quite clear that there's an investigation going on outside the house, and I made a statement, at Mr. Speaker, about my position on all of that uh, two Fridays ago, and I continue to uh, I continue to reinforce that uh, in response to questions from the opposition, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Back to the Premier. Premier, I'm surprised you don't know who said that. Even I was surprised it wasn't you, and it wasn't even your predecessor, although I'm sure he had said similar things many times. It was disgraced President Richard Nixon discussing how he justified his actions in the David Frost interviews. Order, please. Order, please. Last time. Order, please. The, uh, the member is tiptoeing very closely to a rope he doesn't want to hang himself with. And I don't need any other interjections. Please continue. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker. Back to the Premier. The member of That's Agriculture from the order. Nixon interviews surrounding Watergate. It sounds very, very much the same phrase that we've been hearing from you. Premier, you do know how that story unfolded. Is it your intention to disgrace this legislature the same way that President Nixon disgraced his career and the White House Question. when he served? Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, Speaker, I asked the member opposite whether he recognizes the following two quotes. I really don't have a comment to make on this because it's before the courts. Does he recognize who said that? It was just yesterday that the PC member from Whitby, Oshawa, actually made that quote, and I, we agree with her that when it comes to matter of, of anything criminal, let the, we should let the independent authorities do the investigation. Let me ask you another quote, whether you recognize the following quote. Stop interfering in an ongoing investigation and let it run its course. Who said that? Well, that's the, that's the, uh, the opposition House Sorry. leader member from Leeds Grenville said that. I agree with that quote as well, Speaker. Speaker, we know that we have a system in place in this province where if there are investigations that are ongoing, uh, there are by legislation an independent process that is undertaken by prosecutors and by police. We should respect that process, uh, Speaker, and let that independent investigation take place as opposed to Thank commenting you. it in the House. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Parson, the member from Timmins, James Bay. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier needs to tell Ontarians why she's insisting that she decided to appoint her Sudbury candidate in November. In December, the Premier's top insiders were dangling jobs in front of Andrew Olivier to get him to stop seeking the Liberal nomination. At that point, Andrew Olivier said there was no discussion about and no decision about appointing. The president of the Liberal Riding Association said he hadn't heard anything about the decision to appoint. Jerry Lougheed said the Premier didn't want to appoint. And Pat Sabera made it clear that there was no decision to appoint. Now here is a letter from the Premier showing that she was Here's a letter from the Premier showing that there was no decision about appointing until January 2015. Why is the Premier insisting Question. one thing when every single piece of evidence points to something else? Premier. Community Safety and Correction Services. Mr. Community Safety and Corrections. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And again, I think the Premier has asked, answered the same question on several occasions. But let me just provide the member uh, opposite uh, once again a primer on how our system works when it comes to issues like this. When it comes to, for example, any potential violation of, uh, of elections, Ontario ex speaker, as we know, uh, the chief election officer has the authority to do an investigation. Uh, when uh, when he does an inv investigation and he finds if there is an apparent contravention, uh, he refers that matter then to the attorney general for the public prosecutors to determine whether or not there should be any further action taken. The public prosecutor, Speaker, then does uh, his or her own investigation into the matter to decide, best based on evidence, with, whether there should be any charges or not. And if there are charges, then it's up to Thanks, our sir. judges in the courts uh, to determine whether uh, the person is guilty or not. Speaker, that is entire process that is, is arms length independent. We should respect it. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, my question is back to the Premier. And Premier, this province, this legislature doesn't need any primer from Liberals about how to follow or break laws because clearly you guys don't have a very good track record. So I say again, Andrew Olivier, Bill Nurmi, Pat Sabera, Jerry Lougheed, the Premier's own letter says that there shall, that, that says all, they all say that no decision has been made about appointing the Premier's choice and candidate in December. In fact, evidence shows that the decision didn't come until January. Why was, has the Premier been insisting she made a decision in November? Minister. Speaker, uh, I, think, I think, Speaker, in the same way, we don't need any Family primers from the NDP yeah. when it comes to bringing progressive policies in this province that makes a difference in people's life, because that's the party across which Remember voted against uh, increases for our per hardworking personal support workers. This is the party opposite the third party, Speaker, that voted against raising the, the wages for child care workers, Speaker. This is the party across that voted against to increase the minimum wage and indexing it to, uh, to cost of living. That is the party Party speaker that voted against increasing to the child care benefit. We don't need lectures from the third party, which has forgotten this progressive rule speaker. This is the party, and this is the leader here, Premier Kathleen Wynne, which is bringing progressive policies to improve the lives of Ontarians every single day, Speaker. And we will continue to do that and make sure that there's retirement income security for hardworking Ontarians as well. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New. The member will withdraw. The uh, member from Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Ontario's first responders, healthcare professionals, including nurses, transit workers, and correctional officers, have made it very clear. Ontario needs to do more to address traumatic mental stress in the workplace. Recently, I met with frontline nurses and physicians in my riding of Scarborough Agent Court. They share with me many challenges like complexity of care and diversity of issues that frontline health professionals face every day in their practice. This past year, across Canada, first responders and others have been urging their governments to take action to address these growing concerns, traumatic mental stress in the workplace. We have all heard about tragic incidents, including firefighters and police officers who have taken their own lives because they have not been able to get the help they need. We all agree we need to act to prevent this trend from continuing. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what is the province doing to ensure employers are providing support to the employees who are suffering from 
from traumatic mental stress. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you to the member speaker for that very important and very timely question. I think any of us in this House that have a friend, a colleague, or a family member that is dealing with traumatic mental stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, understands the devastating effect this can have on people. Speaker. And speaker, I would agree we need to do everything we can as a legislature, as a province, to ensure that workers get the support they need when they are forced to deal with work-related traumatic mental stress. There's a growing amount of evidence, Speaker, that highlights the benefit of preventive initiatives when it comes to dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. Our government takes this work-related TMS very, very seriously. We engaged a roundtable of experts on traumatic mental stress. We've already begun acting on their proposed actions. Tomorrow, Speaker, we're holding a summit on work-related traumatic mental stress right here in Toronto to build upon the work of that roundtable. Speaker, that's going to attract some of the best and brightest Answer. minds on this, uh, on this topic to Toronto. I'd urge all members to try and attend for a portion. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. It appears that our government is positioning ourselves on the right side of this issue and ensuring Ontario's workplace have the tools they need to address TMS. I recently read that mental illness costs in Canadian economies $52 billion annually in lost productivity, and it is the number one cause of disability claims in Canada. Among those most disproportionately affected by mental health problems are new Canadians and recent immigrants. They face many cultural and linguistic barriers, both in the workplace and in trying to find proper treatment. Mr. Speaker, in my riding of Scarborough Agent Court, there are a number of specialized agencies that serve the diverse community, like the Hong Folk Nurse Practitioner Clinics. So the discussion takes place tomorrow in the summits of work-related traumatic mental stress will empower participants to better serve my constituents and all Ontarians that have Come to spirit. Speaker, through you to the minister, you mentioned earlier about the hosting the summits tomorrow. Can you please elaborate what will they look like and who will be participating? Good. Good. Thank you, minister. <laughs> Speaker, thank you again for the question from the member. The government's bringing together workers, employers, advocates, educators, change leaders, and experts from a wide range of sectors at this summit tomorrow here in Toronto. More than 150 invited representatives will share the innovative approaches they have promote cultural change, they'll learn from other industry leaders on how they can enhance mental health and the safety of their own employees. Now, Speaker, one of the highlights of the summit will be the keynote address by that great humanitarian Lieutenant General, the Honourable Romeo Dallaire. Oh, he spoke his first-hand experience with traumatic mental stress. And if anybody's been an outspoken advocate, Speaker, it's him. The main goal of tomorrow's summit is not to start a conversation on traumatic mental stress. That conversation's already begun. Instead, it's about elevating that conversation to a higher level. I look forward to being part of it. I hope I, hear, I see some of the members that I'm hearing from at that summit tomorrow. Thank you. Especially the member from Holland and Norfolk. Speaker, I have a question to the Premier about the Sudbury by-election. Ontario's Chief Electoral Officer was very clear in that he believed there was an apparent contravention of the bribery statute contained within the Election Act. Your Deputy Chief of Staff, Pat Sabara, is accused of bribery. Your backroom Liberal operative, Jerry Lawhey, is also involved in the alleged bribery. It's illegal to grant government jobs or other positions as a favour. Premier, why have you not removed Jerry Lahey and Pat Severa? Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just um, remind the member opposite, I'm sure he just neglected to read this part of what the uh, Chief Electoral Officer said, Mr. Forgot Speaker, that. and he said, and I quote, I am neither deciding to prosecute a matter nor determining anyone's guilt or innocence. Those decisions are respectively for prosecutors and the member from Dufferin and Speaker, from order. I take this matter very seriously. There is uh, while you were heckling, I indicated that I wanted you to come to order. Carry on. I take this matter very seriously, and uh, as the uh, Minister of uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services has said, there is a process. Uh, that process is uh, being undertaken, undertaken at this moment, but it's a process that takes place outside of this House, Mr. Speaker. That's where the investigation is taking place, and that is exactly where it should take place. Thank you, Supplement. Yeah, yeah. Back, back to the Premier. In our society, in the province of Ontario, we all believe in the rule of law. Justice is blind. No one is beyond it. 
Our rule of law is based on a set of strict principles to which we as a society all agree. Our rule of law is not arbitrary. Our rule of law is not subject to financial influence. You, your friends, your hired operatives believe you are above the law. The fact is, if you break the law, you pay the price. We now have four OPP investigations into this alleged criminal activity, and this reflects badly on everyone. Premier, for the good of all concerned, and if charges are laid, Question? will you step aside? Thank you very much, Speaker. And I really appreciate the member opposite uh, talked about the rule of law because I wish they, her, his other members would recognize what our system, in our system of democracy, what the rule of law what means. Rule of law in our system, Speaker, creates a clear distinction between the executive branch of the government and that of the judicial branch of the government. Speaker, by the same logic that the member opposite talking about, it is, it is prohibited that we, the executive branch, gets involved in the judicial branch of, of the system, Speaker. That is the fundamental tenet of our rule of law. We have a separate judicial process in place right now. There are, there are investigations that is ongoing, and it's only the right and the legal thing to do is to respect those, uh, those investigations and not to comment in this House, Speaker. So I urge all the members opposite. Let's get back to the issues that are important to Ontarians, Speaker. Let's talk about issues that Ontarians are talking about, like building good public infrastructure, Speaker. Thank you. New questions? The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Made offers to Mr. Andrew Olivier. The Premier is on record as saying that's okay because she had already decided to appoint her chosen candidate. She was just helping Mr. Olivier. But the evidence shows something completely different. The evidence showed that the Liberals were desperate to get Mr. Olivier to withdraw from the nomination so that they could have an uncontested nomination meeting. And the letter to the president of the Sudbury Riding Association shows that there was never any decision until long after the attempts to get Andrew Olivier out of the nomination meeting had failed. Will the Premier tell Ontarians the date when she decided she was going to appoint her chosen candidate? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know um, I know that uh, there are members uh, in the third party who uh, who understand that uh, we have that I have the authority and the uh, ability as the uh, as the Liberal leader to appoint candidates, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I made a decision after I had met Glenn Tebow. I've been pressed. Uh, the deputy house leader is warned. Finish. I made a decision that Glenn Tebow was the best person to be our candidate in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I made that decision after I'd met him at the end of November. And, and uh, you know, there is an investigation going on. It's going on outside of this House, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the statement from the Premier has kind of her twisted in a knot where she's trying to explain that really, honestly, and for real, she had decided to appoint her candidate in November, but she didn't tell anyone. She didn't tell her campaign director. She didn't tell her local kingmaker in Sudbury. She didn't tell her candidate. She didn't tell her former candidate, her riding association president, or the Liberal Party, whose constitution makes it clear that she had to do so. Is the Premier going to admit the date when she decided to bypass the nomination meeting and go for an appointment? Because right now, it looks like this date is January. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me say again, and the member, the member opposite actually lives quite close to where all of this was taking place, and I think that the member opposite could, uh, if she looks back at the newspapers, Mr. Speaker, and she would know that uh, it was pretty common knowledge that uh, Glenn Tebow was going to be our candidate. So to suggest that that wasn't the case, Mr. Speaker, I think is, uh, is, is just not accurate. So um, I had made a decision, Mr. Speaker, that Glenn would be the best candidate for us in Sudbury. Um, there is an investigation going on. It's going on outside of this House, and I will, uh, I'll continue to cooperate with, with authorities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. I've had the privilege of advocating on behalf of my community at the federal level, and now I have the privilege to do the same at the provincial level. 
And this is a responsibility I take very seriously, Mr. Speaker. From knocking on doors in the past by-election, my constituents clearly identified the Mellie Drive extension as an important infrastructure project for our community. I am now proud to say that I am part of a government that included this project not only in the past budget, but as part of its submission to the Federal Building Canada Fund. So, Mr. Speaker, would the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure please update this House about the important Sudbury infrastructure project? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is so good, almost refreshing, to see a member from the Sudbury area asking questions that really matter to Sudbury, really matter to our community. It's, a, it's, a, it's with great pleasure, Mr. Speaker, that I can say and confirm that this government is fully committed to our share of the Mailey Drive project. We know that the project's very important to the people of Sudbury, as it will reduce congestion along two of the city's main arterial roads. In our 2014 budget, our government committed up to $26.7 million for the first phase of the expansion of Manly Drive. We highlighted this project again in our, in our recent budget. Mr. Speaker, the NDP had an opportunity to vote for this project. In the first budget, they rejected it. They had a second Answer. opportunity, they rejected it again. We're looking forward to hearing from the federal governments with an approval so that Manly Drive can go through. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd also like to thank the minister for driving this important project forward. And I too remain optimistic that the federal government comes to the table and commits to this project, Mr. Speaker. However, Mr. Speaker, seeing firsthand when I was a member of Parliament, the federal Conservatives are not making adequate investments in infrastructure, not just in Ontario, but across the country. They are shortchanging Ontarians and all Canadians, Mr. Speaker. Fortunately, this government and this premier prioritizes infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. Our Premier is calling for a new Canadian inf infrastructure partnership, a collaboration that has the explicit target of investing 5 per cent of GDP in infrastructure renewal. So, Mr. Speaker, would the Minister please inform the House about this drastic comparison between federal and provincial infrastructure spending? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member is absolutely right. The federal government is not adequately investing in infrastructure. Since 2003, this government's invested nearly $100 billion in infrastructure, and we're investing $130 billion in infrastructure over the next 10 years. That will create 110,000 jobs across this province. Comparing our record to the federal government over the next 10 years, our government plans to invest nearly five times more per capita in infrastructure than the federal government. Mr. Speaker, you'd be hard-pressed to find a national government anywhere in the world doing so little compared to the provincial governments across this province. Our Premier is absolutely right. The federal government must commit more to a national infrastructure partnership. Projects like Mailey Drive, the Ring of Fire, public transit need the federal Answer. government to committing more so that we can continue to compete in this glo fiercely globally competitive economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Remember. <laughs> Jesus, almost got hit here. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. I'm, gl I'm glad to see your enthusiasm. My question is for the Premier. Premier, what? since the very beginnings of this Sudbury by election. Stop the clock. Order, please. Let's uh, let's reboot. <laughs> the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, since the very beginnings of the Sudbury by-election scandal, you have made many sad excuses for Liberals behaving in unethical ways. <laughs> from the response in my riding, and in fact from all across this great province. I can tell you that Ontarians are saying that by your unwillingness to admit wrongdoing and dismiss those who are accused of criminal offences, you are dim dis diminishing the high office you hold. Later today, our leader will address the House regarding his opposition to a motion. Will you finally accept responsibility for defending Liberals 
under criminal investigation and acknowledge Question. that if you will not have them step aside, you are in fact breaching the public trust. Excellent. Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, I, I can assure um, the members opposite and, and anyone watching that we take this issue very, very seriously. We've heard the Premier time and time again talk about how any investigation should be conducted by qualified people outside of this legislature. In fact, Speaker, um, when asked about charges laid against a, a PC, just as charges laid against a PC staff member just this week, the PC member from Whitby, Oshawa, said, "I really don't have a comment to make on this because it's before the courts." Uh, Speaker, the PC House leader uh, agrees with um, uh, with the member from Whitby, Oshawa. She said that. To stop, Order. he said, stop interfering in an ongoing investigation. Answer. Let it run its course. That's so, Speaker. We we actually take the wisdom from the members opposite. The member from Leeds, Grenville, come to order. We will be discussing this in the House. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, that was a sad and disappointing response from the Deputy Premier. Premier, back to you. During your leadership speech, you said, and I quote. This is the time, right now, to show what, that we've learned from our mistakes, that they will not happen again." End quote. By standing in the way of our opposition motion, mm -hmm. you will show that this is the same tired, arrogant, unethical Liberal government that you inherited from Dalton McGuinty. Yep. You have put your own ego and the needs of your party before the needs of the people of Ontario. Premier, I ask you again, will you acknowledge the breach of ethics and stop stonewalling our efforts to get to the bottom of this scandal and put Pat Sabera and Jerry Lahey in the penalty box at least until this investigation is complete. Excellent. Deputy well, Speaker, I have to say that what I find to be very disappointing is that uh, both both uh, opposition parties have, for the last number of weeks, asked the same question over and over and over again. They have used their questions uh, to do this muckraking instead of focusing on issues that matter. Now, we have people from the credit unions here today, Speaker. They've got important questions. I think they'd like to be asking. They'd like you to be asking us about questions that they're here to discuss, Speaker. Uh, we've had uh, various people here, uh, the Children's Treatment Centers. I bet they have questions that they'd like you to be asking us. You've asked the questions over and over again. You have the same answer answer. over and over again. I think you're letting your constituents down by not asking the questions they want to hear answers. Thank you. Your question, a member from Windsor, Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Speaker, according to the evidence, the Premier decided to appoint her hand-picked candidate the same day that the writ was dropped. If the Premier is claiming she decided to appoint her hand-picked candidate in November, why, why did she wait until the 11th hour to actually make that appointment? So, so let's understand this question. The member, good morning, the member um, is asking about why the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party didn't get the paperwork in when he thinks she ought to have done that. Now, so I think that's a pretty ridiculous. big stretch, Speaker. It's a my, my colleague says a ridiculous question. I wouldn't say it's a ridiculous question, but it's not a question that pertains to government policy, government business. It's not a question, I'll bet, that the, the people in Windsor are wanting their members to ask. Speaker, it's not when I think what the Premier should have done. Why didn't the Premier follow the Liberal Constitution and inform the Liberal Party as soon as she made her decision to appoint her candidate? It's in the Constitution, for God's sake. Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's very clear that the nomination process in the NDP party, or then New Democrat Party, is not the same as it is in the Ontario Liberal Party. In the Ontario Liberal Party, because members of the party have voted constitutional rules that give the leader 
the, uh, uh, the ability to appoint candidates. The NDP just ran through the candidate they want. They, they put someone in charge of the process, and then that person, Adam Giambroni, ends up running, um, uh, running for that nomination in Scarborough Guildwood. I don't like your way of, of doing nominations, but I'm not going to be stand up and ask you about your party constitution in this place. Thank you. Your question, the member from Newmarket Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I understand that today is Credit Union Advocacy Day. We have members of credit unions from across the province visiting Queen's Park today and meeting with MPPs. I had the wonderful opportunity to meet with uh, members of credit unions uh, from my riding of Newmarket Aurora Meridian and telling me about the wonderful things they're doing in our riding. They're telling us about the wonderful things they're doing in all of our ridings. Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate that the opposition are not asking questions about the good work the credit unions do and the important role they play in our provincial economy. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Finance, what is our government doing to support this Question. critical industry? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for a great question. The member from Newmarket, Aurora, has rightly cited how important the credit union and Caisse Populaire are to the province of Ontario, to their communities, and to our economy, and we appreciate the outstanding work that the sector does for all of us concerned. And on behalf of all of my Liberal caucus members and colleagues, we recognize that in order for credit unions to continue to do its good work, we have to review its act. And I'm very proud that our parliamentary assistant, Laura Albanese, the MPP from York Southwestern, is doing a tremendous job of consulting with the communities right across Ontario in terms of what we should do to build Ontario up, looking at ways to continue providing that investment, those incentives for businesses to invest, for consumers to build and create more jobs that wouldn't be possible without the outstanding partnership with our credit unions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the Minister of Finance for that informative answer. This review will assist credit union workers to continue to do their important work in building up Ontario's economy. I know in my riding of Newmarket Aurora, we value the work of credit unions. I see the important contributions they make to my community day in and day out. Good. But Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance please provide some more information on this important review that he's uh, requested of MPP uh, Laura Albanese to lead? Thank can. you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you again to the member. Mr. Speaker, there are over 118 credit unions wow. in Ontario, serving 1.6 million members, employing over 6,000 people, and holding over $40 billion in assets. They deserve to ensure that the government, in partnership with them, will do what's necessary for them to continue to succeed. Looking at deposit insurance coverage limits, looking at revisiting subsidiary ownership, reviewing and adopting Basel III capital requirements and inputs that they know is important, enabling innovation so that we can all do better, and ensuring that they are able to do even do more business with more sectors of our economy, like the MUSH sector. We hear you loud and clear. They're not asking you those questions. We will, and we'll fight for you as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can you say it, please? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A reminder to all members that uh, you're addressing your questions and answers to the chair. And now that I have quiet, I'll say it again for those that didn't hear. In this place, you direct your questions and answers to the chair. New question, member from Stormont Dundas and South Pangir. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. You did not inform the Sudbury Riding Association of your intention to appoint a candidate for weeks, during which time your operatives, Pat Sabrera and Jerry Lahey, allegedly tried to bribe your former candidate for an early appointment so that your Liberal no stop. 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 The Minister of Energy come to order and everyone else. Please put your question. At the time, your Liberal operatives, Pat Sabera and Jerry Lahey, allegedly tried to bribe your former candidate with a public appointment so that your Liberal nomination would go to your chosen candidate uncontested. You breached your own party's constitution 
and your operatives allegedly broke the law, according to the Chief Electoral Officer. However, you stated that after your review, there will likely be no charges. So when did you offer yourself the appointment as prosecutor, judge and jury? And when did you ask yourself what to give up in exchange for this? Question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I, uh, um, I challenge the premise of some of the statements that uh, the member opposite has made. Um, I've been very clear that uh, uh, I will cooperate with the authorities. I take it very seriously. I made a statement that laid out uh, my position, Mr. Speaker, and I have said very clearly that this is an investigation that needs to take place outside of the House. I've also said very clearly that when I met, when I first met Glenn, uh, I made a decision that he would be the best candidate for us in uh, in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, and I think that was a very good decision, borne out by the fact that the people of Sudbury chose him as their representative yeah. here at Queen's Park, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Speaker, back to the Premier. Your office is subject to four OPP investigations. At this pace, investigators will need their own reserved parking spot at Queen's Park. Your candidates own your own candidates don't trust you to come clean. Minister of Agriculture. Your candidates don't trust you to come clean and have released recorded tapes for the truth to come out. Andrew Olivier could not have been offered an appointment without your blessing, because you would have to sign off on it. It shouldn't take the police questioning and leaked tapes to get to the truth in the Premier of Ontario. Did you decide to offer Andrew Olivier a public appointment in the time between your decision to appoint Glenn Thibault as a candidate and your letter to the Riding Association? Mr. Speaker. You know, when I say that the investigation is taking place outside of this House, what I mean is that there will be questions asked and answered by authorities, by people who are qualified to ask those questions, Mr. Speaker, and then come to conclusion. I understand the politics of what's going on here. I understand why it's important to the Conservatives to ask these questions over and over, because they don't want to talk about what's going on in their leadership race. I understand that. I understand why the NDP would want to ask these questions, because they don't want to talk about the fact that they lost in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, and that they lost a member from the NDP, walked across the floor and came to us. I understand the politics, Mr. Speaker, but I will not be distracted from the reality that we have a lot of work to do on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. We have Answer. work in terms of investments. We have work in terms of getting a budget ready that will be in the best interest of the people of the province. I'll answer the questions that the authorities ask me, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question. Member from Timiskimi Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Seeing as the Premier is unable to produce any evidence to back up her timeline of events, my constituents are wondering if she can provide any evidence on who gave Pat Cerbera and Jerry Lawhey their orders to offer Andrew Olivier a job. Well, I, I go back to my previous answer, Mr. Speaker, that I, I will I will answer and uh, I will cooperate with the authorities uh, in the investigation that's taking place outside of this House. And I understand the politics of what the NDP is doing right here, Mr. Speaker. They don't want to talk about their own process. They don't want to talk about the painful reality that we put in place a progressive plan that drew an NDP member from the federal party into our party, Mr. Speaker, that, that put in place a plan for Sudbury and all parts of the province, Mr. Speaker, that are in the best interest of the economy and in the best interest of people in their day-to-day Lives. They don't want to talk about that, Mr. Speaker. So they want they're taking on the role of judge and jury, Mr. Speaker, in terms of work that is being done outside of this house. The investigation is happening outside of this house. I will cooperate with authorities, Answer. Mr. Speaker. In the meantime, in the meantime, Mr. Speaker, I hope that the uh, members opposite understand that that's the appropriate wow. thing to do. Once again, to the Premier, I guess openness and transparency has turned into deflect, deflect, deflect. Every piece of evidence points toward bribery, but the Premier says, no, we're only trying to help out our friends. The Premier has been asked to provide evidence for her version of the story for more than two weeks. Let's try this once again. Is there any evidence for the Premier's version of events? 
Mr. Community Safety Protection Service. Well, I guess, I, and I guess, uh, Speaker, the the uh, the tactic, the tactic of the of the NDP is to distract, distract, distract from the real issues that needs to be dealt with in this province. They're trying to distract, distract, distract from their abysmal record in 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 uh, electionary. They just can't catch a break. They can't win an election, Speaker, and they're they're bitter about that. Their party members are asking about that. So what they're doing, they're talking about every other issue possible to deflect from their own dismal electoral politics because they have they have foregone, Speaker. They've foregone their progressive values because, Speaker, we here in the Liberal Party and the government are working on things that are important to Ontarians, like investing in our personal support workers, like investing in our child care workers, like making sure that full-day kindergarten now, Speaker, is available to, to, all, uh, to all four- and five-year-olds across the province. And now, Speaker, we're working on the most important Order. issue, that is to ensure that there is retirement income security for hard-working Ontarians who do not have a workplace pension, and investing yes, in critical public infrastructure across the province so Thank that uh, our families can get to work. Thank you. New question? The member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, staff and volunteers at children's treatment centres work hard to support children and youth with physical, communication and developmental needs. Children treatment centres give young people the skills to be independent and live a happy and healthy life. In my riding of Halton, Erin Oak Kids is doing wonderful work. Erin Oak Kids is Ontario's largest children's treatment centre with approximately 600 staff in 10 locations. Wow. They provide a comprehensive range of support services to more than 14,500 Ontario children and their families. In Halton, they have taken over 500 children off their wait list for core rehab services. That's service. 500 children who have received support Question. in areas like autism services, occupational therapy, or medical assistance. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain how you are working to help children's treatment centres do you. their work? Thank you. Children Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Hall for raising this very important question. And Speaker, I was really hoping to get more questions today about children with special needs because the Ontario Association of Children's Rehab Services is here. Jennifer Churchill and the folks from that organization who do fantastic work. And uh, I was I was hoping for more from the opposition. But having said that, I'm happy to get this question. And uh, I'm happy, of course, to acknowledge the new investments to reduce wait lists for core rehab services services and assessments that brings my ministry's funding to $101.4 million for the year 2014-15. When I was parliamentary assistant two years ago, Speaker, I traveled the province listening to families, listening to service providers, listening to researchers, and they helped us shape and inform the special needs strategy yes, for us. It's very important work, Speaker, and uh, I'm just so happy the association's here and we'll be meeting Thank with you. them later today. Thank you. Ministry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My next question, again through you, is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, I'm pleased to hear about how much our government is doing to improve funding for children's treatment centres such as Erin Oak Kids. This means a great deal to constituents in my riding, many of whom have expressed their appreciation of our government's commitment to improving the lives of children throughout the province. This support is invaluable to the children and their families who are working to meet the challenges of everyday life. Minister, can you tell me what is being achieved through our increased funding for children's treatment centres? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the member for the question. So late last year, my ministry invested an additional $5 million per year, every year, Speaker, to help children's treatment centres reduce wait lists and core rehab services uh, and time to get to that. We've also invested $1.2 million this year to help the treatment centres further reduce time on the wait lists and time to get assessed. This has expanded access to physio, occupational therapy and speech language therapy. It's enabled children's treatment centers to serve an additional 2,000 children speaker, uh, children and youth across the province. Increased funding of almost $7 million over the next two years for preschool speech and language will help over 10,000 children across the province reduce wait time for speech and language. Thank you. We look forward to continued investments. Thank you. Stop the clock. 
Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question, the member from Leeds, Grenville. So very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. But uh, before, I hope you can give me some leeway, Premier. Today, uh, or Speaker, Speaker, today uh, is my fifth anniversary of being elected as an MPP. And uh, as well, five years ago, uh, the Minister of Energy was elected as well, and I want to congratulate him on the award that his ministry received today. They got a Canadian Taxpayer Federation Teddy Award for government waste for the Smart Meter program. So congratulations and happy anniversary. Premier, uh, listen, we've got, a, we've got a, uh, an Opposition Day motion today, Speaker. Uh, Premier, I think you can preempt it. I think so we've asked these questions in the House. You've got a, a tremendous opportunity to do the right thing, to show some integrity in your office by asking uh, Pat Sorbera and Jerry Lawhe to step aside. Are you going to do it, Premier? Please, please do it before today's Thank you. Opposition Day motion. Thank you, Premier. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased that the member referred to smart meters, um, and uh, I'm very pleased to speak about that issue, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have uh, one of the best electricity systems in the world, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we were cutting edge when we installed 4.8 million smart meters in our system, Mr. Speaker, and enables us to do tremendous work. Mr. Speaker, first of all, smart meters eliminated about 2,000 jobs by not having to have people walk door to door to read meters, Mr. Speaker. We have a new generation, a generation those people over there don't understand. They make jokes about smart meters, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Mr. Speaker, it's saving people money. Mr. Speaker, the, the, uh, well, I would challenge each, each member of the Conservative Party over there. Which one of you Thank is you. not using? Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. Back to the, uh, back to the Premier again. Another answer that's not very smart in this legislature. Um, Premier, um, you could really take this uh, order this seriously. You and I have had a lot of questions over the last few days. We've got an unprecedented report from the Chief Electoral Officer. Uh, you forced our hand today with our Opposition Day motion. But, Premier, you still have time. You still have an opportunity to do the right thing and show some integrity in your office. Remember, you're the one whose throne speech said in this House that you were going to do things differently. You were going to do things differently than your predecessor. But all we're seeing and hearing in question period, day after day after day, is the same old, tired, liberal rhetoric. Premier, do the right thing. Show the leadership that you said you would in this House. Ask those two individuals to question. step aside and try to renew some semblance of respect back into your office. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, referring to his uh, uh, reference to smart meters, Mr. Speaker, uh, they alert utilities when lines go down, saving tremendous money for all the utilities across the province, Mr. Speaker. They redirect, redirect electricity to restore power outages, Mr. Speaker. They improve billing accuracy, Mr. Speaker, and they enhance the, uh, the efficiency of the system in many other ways, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Hydro Toronto, Mr. Speaker, have confirmed uh, that it has reduced consumption by 3 percent. There have been other studies that showed tremendous uh, savings to consumers, Mr. Speaker. We're very, very proud of the technology. We're cutting edge, uh, uh, leading uh, electricity systems across the world are copying what we're doing here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Premier, out of point of order. Speaker, I am delighted to welcome Harry Justin here today, a Londoner from Libro, uh, Libro Financial, and a great citizen of London. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.